Hey guys, welcome back to Henry Sentinel Tutoring, and today a video about WinBind and how you can use it to authenticate users logging in to Linux servers against the Windows Active Directory Domain Controller. We'll also look at how to limit which users can log in, as well as how to limit which users have access to sudo up to root. Remember, if you enjoy this content, please like the video, subscribe, and if you have any feedback or questions, just leave them below in the, in the comments section and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And with that, on with the video. So the first thing we'll have a look at is I've got this little server I've made very recently. It's a fresh install of Ubuntu 18.04. And one thing we'll need to do is to make sure we can sync the clock to our Activity server, as if we don't have clock sync, we can't authenticate. So we'll just do some little changes here. We'll install NTP date. Then we'll just grab a stamp of the current time right now. So we have that in our console for comparison. We'll set up the NTP server address. This is the address for my domain controller in timesyncd.conf. We'll restart timesyncd.conf, or we'll restart timesyncd. Then we'll just uh, force an NTP date command here on the time on the uh, server that should synchronize our clock and afterwards we'll check and see that yes time has been adjusted so now we're good there the next step is to install the packages required for samba kerberos uh, is windbind as well as the uh, um, pam windbind and nss uh, the nss windbind libraries so we'll go ahead and do that uh, once this is done, we'll just do a quick test of Kerberos to make sure we can authenticate. In here, you're going to want to put in your your actual domain in all capitals, so we'll just do that. There we go, that's been set. And now, we will run a kinit administrator. Let's see if that populates into the console when this all finishes. And almost, nope, it didn't. Okay, so that's fine. We'll just do it again. <laughs> there we go. We'll enter in our password for the administrative user, and we'll do a K list to list out any tickets that we got. And we did. We got a login that was successful. So that means that uh, we can talk to our Kerberos server successfully on the Windows machine. So next thing to do is to... Uh, modify the Samba config file. I'm just going to move the current one that's in there by default out of the way and start with a fresh one from scratch. So I've got the configuration sort of uh, saved in the little text editor of mine here. I'm just going to paste it in. I'll go over it quickly here. So it's all under the, it's all under the actual global configuration. The first thing we're doing is defining the work group and the realm that we want to use for our AD d domain. Then we're telling it to use the AD security model. Uh, we just specify a, a DNS forger entry for any DNS entries that, uh, that, that the actual SAMBA server can't handle that it has requests for. Next, we have the ID map section. And this sort of is responsible for configuring uh, the range of IDs that are used um, by, by uh, the actual WinBind process uh, to assign like, you know, the actual numerical user ID value to different users as they are added to the system. So we just give it a range as to where it wants to uh, sort of add this. Uh, you can use different methods to this. There's uh, a different backend option you can use where it actually just looks this up right from the server versus maintaining its own, sorry, where it looks this up from the Active Directory domain controller versus maintaining its own database on the server. Next, we have a little line that will define the home directory location. So you can add, if you want, a percent %d, which will result in the uh, user's home directory containing the domain name as well as the uh, as as, it's at, as as their actual username, if you like. Uh, you can also set the shell in here. There's some options here for Kerberos, or well, a option for Kerberos to use the secrets only method for verifying tickets, which are basically what we did when we actually did that little test with the administrative user. Uh, then we set this option here, use default domain equal to true. This basically makes it so that we will always use the realm we defined up here uh, 
as a prefix to the username when someone logs in. This prevents you from having to type out the, the actual domain in the uh, IS actual username field when you SSH into the server. So it makes it a bit easier for, for people to access it. Uh, next we have uh, winbind offline login equals false. This disables the winbind uh, IS process from caching the user credentials so that they can log in if the attribute server isn't present or accessible. Um, there might be situations where you need that, but probably uh, in most in most actual in in most in environments you don't it's just going to be uh, always there and if it's not there's a bigger problem on hand that you need to resolve so then some more options here we have um, NSS info this allows WinBind to retrieve things like uh, the actual login shell and home directory attributes if they're present from the AD server itself so you can set that up if, if you need to do so uh, that takes a bit of extra work if you want to to actually go through and uh, add those options to each user's account. So with uh, this stuff here, you don't actually have to worry about that unless you want to define it specifically for certain users. Next, we have these options, which allow for the WinBind process to uh, list out the different users and groups. If these aren't set, you can't list them, which we'll show I guess, briefly later. There may be some cases where it's desirable to turn this off, like if you have, if you have a very large uh, if you have a very large list of users in your AD domain. So uh, next we have WinBind nested group support being turned on. We've disabled our printer support, so we don't load any printers up from the AD domain. And then there's just some final options to set some NTFS permissions and to, um, I guess, uh, set ACL, to set ACL information, as well as also to populate the Unix file permissions with whatever DOS file attributes are assigned to different files if you're mounting Samba shares or, I guess, uh, 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 or if like you're mentioning actual Windows shares. So this is the configuration file. We'll save that. Now that we've done that, we're going to do an, an, a, an initial restart of our Samba processes. We'll get an error, and the error should basically be about us not being part of the actual domain yet. If we check it out, we can see that uh, we couldn't fetch our SID value. Did we join a... a uh, did we join a domain? We didn't yet, so that's okay. We will just run this little command here now to stop any localized Samba active, active, directory, active directory domain controller. Once we've done that, we can then uh, make sure we enable the Samba server software on boot as well as also WinBind. Then we're gonna join the actual domain itself so we'll run this command here, it'll prompt for our password, and this will join us to the win2012-thelab.lan domain. Once we've done this, we just need to edit the ns switch file, etc ns, sw ns switch, and we need to replace the systemd options here with winbind instead. And we'll also add that on to the end here. Now that's done, we're gonna restart once again, just to make sure things are good and ready to go, and then we should be able to list out our users and groups. So we can run these commands here to get our users and groups, and we can just do some little checks here. We can check our admin user, we can see what, what actual user ID and group ID they have by default, where their home directory would be placed all this lovely information. We can also check for a different user on this AD domain. There we go, that's the support one user. We'll see that one a bit later. Next thing to do is to modify PAM authentication to, oops, don't hit escape, to basically uh, to let PAM sort of create a home directory for any new user that logs in. Otherwise they'll log in and then they won't have a location for their files. Next thing we do is to remove the auth tok option, use auth tok from this common password file. And this allows the users when they're logged in to any of the actual Linux hosts to run the password command and change their password on the AD domain from one of the Linux systems. 
So maybe if you have a user that's very heavily oriented on Linux, doesn't really log in to a actual Windows machine ever, then this can allow them to update their password as they need, you know, as they may need to do so by company policy. Next, we look at adding permission for certain users to log in based on their group. So we're going to look at the etc security access.com file. So let's pull this guy up here. And this file basically lets you define, I guess, rules that state who can log in and from where. So you can see you can specify where root can log in from, maybe an IP address that it's allowed to connect from, or you could replace root with a user, or you could have it as a group. So it's all based on groups, really. So that's the root group. Let's see here. So we're going to edit this and we're going to add in some entries here. We'll actually I'll just copy it in from my notepad. So we've, we've set this up so we can let root or the admin guy user, which I'm logging as now to log in from any location, as well as the sales group. Anything else is denied. And we've also allowed for cron um, access in, in here, basically. So once we've done that, we need to modify the PAM SSHD file, which is an etc pam.d SSHD. In this file, you should find a line that you can uncomment that will require the PAM access.so file to be I guess, actually looked at. This, this basically results in the SSH process when you log in and it runs the, the, uh, the actual PAM module for SSH to look at that access.com file. If you don't do this, you're just not going to care about what's in there and your restrictions won't work. So now we've done that, let's just do a test. We'll do a login here on a separate, uh, let's open a new tab here. So SSH2 as one of the support users, actually a sales user, sorry, because we added the sales guys in there. Uh, this is the IP address of the system in question. And we should be able to log in. There we go, we can log in, that's a good sign. And if we try and get root access, we should be denied. Yeah, so we're not part of the sudoers file, we can't get to root. So let's change that. Let's also, uh, let's also inspect me as well. We'll try to log in as one of the support users and we should get denied based on the access file. And yes, let's close our connection. We did provide the right, the actual right credentials, but we were then kicked out afterwards because uh, we're not part of that access.conf file. So if we were to update that file quickly and we add support, and save it. We can try again. One of these support group users. We should now be able to access this host, and we can. So that's good. Anyways, let's look at adding access for sudo next. So one of the ways you can do this is you can add a user to the sudo group, which is very easy. We can just run this command here: user mod ag sudo support one. This will add the support one user to the sudo group. Now, if I log in again, the support one and I run my sudo command, I can now get to root. So that's good, It's one way to do it. Let's look at how we can do this using a entry for a group instead. So if we edit etc sudoers, we can add a group line down here. We can say, uh, let's see, support can get root access. Let's just do this. There we go. Oh, force that to write. Now, if we go back and we uh, log in instead, this time we'll use support two, which we did not add to the sudo group with this command. We only did support one, the user. We'll log in to support two, and we will try to get root access. And there we go. We've been allowed root access because we're part of that uh, that support group, basically. If you run the id command, well, as the user, you can see what groups they're part of. And we can see that we are definitely part of that particular group. So that's good. Now there's one other thing we can do as well, which may be of use in some cases. If we go into etc sudoers.d, we can actually define a file 
In this case, I'll call it sales. And here you can define a number of files. Uh, you can check this readme file out. It gives you some information about what you can do in here, I guess. Anyways, uh, we're going to make a file called sales. And in this file, we'll specify a host alias line. And this line is going to contain any host names that we want to allow um, this group access to. So if you're using like some kind of automated uh, deployment system, say like Ansible or Chef or Salt to edit configurations on newly provisioned servers and to set them up for your environment, you can define a pre-set uh, selection of files that contain all the host names of uh, servers that different groups should have root access on. And then you can allow users that access in a very easy manner. It makes it uh, easy to maintain who has access to sudo and who doesn't on particular servers. So in this case, we're going to give the sales group access to WinBind 1 win and WinBind 2 servers, which we're working on right now, WinBind 2. Oops. So we've got that set up. We'll write that. And now we will go back over here and we'll log in as one of the sales users. So we'll jump out of there. We'll come in as sales 2, I guess. And we can log in, and we should be able to get root, and we can. Just to give you an idea here, so if you do a LSLAN, we can see there is a bunch of information here. We can see basically the numerical user IDs that we saw earlier assigned to different users showing up in the users column, and then the domain uh, users ID showing up in, the, in this group column. So if we learn to do dash n, we can see these are all domain users. This is a local user that we made when, we, when I built the system. So that's sort of how that works. Uh, we can, I'll show you quickly the SSH into the WinBind 1 server. So sales1 at if you want to say it, I think it's uh, 2.21. Oh, not that, sorry, 6.21. So here are, we're in WinBind 1 now. We can also log in as root there with sudo. And if we were to check uh, sudoers.d sales, we can see a similar entry in here where I had some other servers configured and set. But as long as we have a match here on this uh, on this line for whatever host name that we're on now. So as long as our host name matches in here, it will allow you to, 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 to escalate with, with a, like the actual sudo command to root. So if I was to change that quickly and maybe remove winbind2, oops, we'll remove winbind2 here, and then I'll log out and I'll log back in as sales we should be denied getting root access. Now yeah, we're not allowed, but that same file, if deployed to the WinBind 1 server, would allow it. So this is basically uh, what you can do with WinBind and uh, one of, uh, I guess, the more common systems for maintaining access control at a directory out there. So if you have a combined network infrastructure where you've got Windows and Linux hosts in the same in environment and you don't want to have to deal with multiple logins maintaining on different systems, this is uh, one way you can sort of centralize things. You don't have to worry about that as much. Anyways, I will hopefully see you in the next video. Take care.